Hello everyone, welcome to week seven of the semester. We're halfway through. Um, this will be the last topic before spring break. Uh, and this week we'll be looking at voting, elections, campaigns, and the media, different ways, um, kind of starting from kind of a pluralist theory perspective of influencing government outcomes. Uh, and then we're gonna kind of complicate that as we usually do by looking at different forms of power. So this first lecture is focusing on voting, elections, and campaigns. Um, thinking about how voting and political campaigns can influence public policy, uh, explaining the correlates and reasons for voting and the effectiveness of political campaigns. Uh, we'll also be looking at the kind of second and third phases of power in with respect to voting elections and campaigns. So usually we would think of voting and campaigns as more or less the kind of first phase of power, though it it does get a little bit tricky even at this first phase of power. Because on the one hand, this is very much straightforward pluralist theory. Whichever group is going to mobilize the most voters is going to be able to elect their people into Congress and influence uh, Congress to pass policies that they prefer. But Congress isn't just a recipient of pressure, uh, but, con but members of Congress run campaigns to try to influence voters, right? They try to promise they try to leverage their resources. They can promise, you know, different uh, types of policies uh, that they have. They can promise, you know, different types of spending programs or priorities that might help their constituents, all with the goal of, you know, providing resources to the voters to sway them. So this first phase of power really goes back and forth between uh, the people and politicians here. But let's dig in a little deeper here. So. So what do we mean by voting? Voting more or less, especially in, in a representative democracy is the means by which citizens can choose their representatives. It's the most obvious and primary ways that individuals can influence public policy. Um, voting happens at all levels of government, uh, local, state, and national office all have elections. However, even at the national level, so even their elections for president are administered by the states. And we saw this in the most recent presidential election in, in the fall. Right, where different states had different kind of voting regulations with regard to early voting or absentee voting because of COVID. Um, so the fact that there's a lot of power in the state governments to determine how elections will be administered that can influence electoral outcomes, even for national office, even for the presidency. Voter registration laws vary from state to state. Whoops. Sorry. Uh, vary from state to state. Uh, different states have different requirements about when you have to when you have to register, how, what you need to register, etc. Um, the Twenty Fourth Amendment and the Voting Rights Act ensured the right to vote protected, uh, regardless of race. However, the 2013 Supreme Court decision of Shelby County versus Holder uh, limited the parts of the Voting Rights Act by declaring that the requirement of uh, that certain states with a history of voter disenfranchisement would have any changes to their voting administration pre-cleared by the Justice Department. Um, it ruled that that was unconstitutional and it allowed for many states in, uh, to uh, most notably, some of the most famous examples were in Georgia, Ohio, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, to change their voter registration law regulations to make it eat harder for especially communities of color to register to vote. Oops. Uh, their motor voter laws allow people to register to vote while they get driver's license. And some states have started experimenting with online voter registration. Um, the motor voter, the National Voter Registration Act of 1993 uh, is what made this motor voter turnout. Um, so, so the idea here is that when you register to get a driver's license, you can register to vote at the same time. However, it did not really, uh, while it did increase voter registration by 7%, it only increased turnout by a pretty small uh, amount. Uh, the state of Oregon has automatic voter registration at the age of 18. Um, and so there's, so once you turn 18, you are automatically registered to vote in the state of Oregon. Um, and there is pretty good social science research that suggests that specific state regulations have a significant influence on the likelihood of voter registration. So that the state regulations about how difficult or how easy it is to register to vote have an effect on voter turnout. 
Now, some of these state regulations include uh, residency, uh, that you have to establish a time period of residency in the state for, uh, before you can register to vote in that state. And these vary state to state of how long you have to be a resident. Uh, there's also the question of how early do you have to register to vote prior to the election. In some states like California, you can have day of registration and receive a provisional ballot. Then once your registration is verified, that ballot will be counted. In many other states, you have to register sometimes at least 30 days before the election in order to be eligible to vote. Um, some states require you to register with a party affiliation if the state has what's known as a closed primary in which only the members of that party can um, vote in that primary election. States have various also exclusions on registration to vote. Um, one of the biggest ones is that of <clears throat> mental competency. If you are declared mentally incompetent, that you are not able to make decisions for yourself autonomously, you can lose your, you can not be eligible to vote. And the concern here is people taking, manipulating or taking advantage of uh, people, mentally incompetent people who are unable to make decisions, in fact, uh, fully make consenting decisions for themselves. The other ex kind of big exclusion is felony status uh, that some states exclude. Most states will um, ex prohibit you from voting while you are serving a prison sentence, but many other states include uh, if you have any felony conviction um, or if you have um, that you are still ineligible to vote. Um, so that you, even if you have served your sentence and you are out and you're released, um, you can be, lose your eligibility to vote. So what drives voting? Why, what, what kind of are the influences that make people more or less likely to vote? Um, age is a big one. The older you are, the more likely you are to vote. And there's a, we can think of a few reasons here. You have more knowledge right um you've you know been around elections for a longer time you have more just kind of tacit political knowledge but you also have more social capital you're going to be more connected into your communities you're you know you serve on the board of your church or community organization you you know volunteer with this group or that group and maybe that, that social capital might make you more likely to vote you've also been socialized to voting for a much longer period of time and if especially if you are retired you have more free time Education is also a strong correlate uh, that college-educated college voters, 75% um, of college-educated voters are likely to vote while only 50, around 50% of um, high school voters. And you can think of this in terms of the information costs and, and also the correlation between education and income. Um, that the more educated you are, the lower the, the cost of gathering information about how to vote and, and voting are. There's also more socialization that happens with greater levels of education. Uh, again, similar relationships between high income and low income for similar reasons of education. Uh, and when we look at race, um, both white Americans and African Americans are more more likely, significantly more likely to vote than Asian Americans and Latinos. Um, that data is starting to change, at least with the uh, the, the Latinx vote um, increasingly turning out in, in recent recent elections. And uh, in general, women tend to vote more frequently than men. But there are also institutional reasons that shift why people whether people are likely to vote. Um, it's non mandatory, right? Um, you do not have to, you're not required to vote. And so there's always going to be this kind of rational opportunity cost calculation, right? If we think back to Down's paradox from way back in week one or week two, um, that, that it's kind of irrational to vote because the chances of you actually, your vote actually leading to a unique benefit for yourselves is probably much lower than the real concrete cost that you have to pay to vote. A various voter ID, ID requirements make it significantly harder for those who are uh, poorer, or those who are homeless, those uh, those who live in cities and might not have driver's license because you rely on public transportation. Um, all make it harder for the, these groups to vote. Uh, um, the limited time to vote, you have to vote on election day uh, in most places, uh, in many places, where uh, some states have experimented with like, you know, Universal early voting, California has done this, um, that you can vote whenever, and that lowers, again, the opportunity cost because you can vote when it is more convenient to you. 
and also questions of political culture. Um, one of the reasons why the African American vote is so is as high as the white vote in terms of uh, turnout rate is, is because there's a strong kind of culture in the sense of the civil rights movement uh, around socializing socializing voting uh, and enc encouraging voting that this is a strong kind of aspect of African American political culture. Um, so that can influence votes voting as well. So why, what, how do people make decisions? Um, the kind of the most frequently used kind of strategy that people use to make their voting decisions is what's known as retrospective voting, uh, that they view the election on it's a referendum on the incumbent party, whatever party is in office. They view the election as a referendum on them and it's like, are they better off than they were two years ago, four years ago? Um, if they are, then they vote for the incumbent. If not, they vote against the incumbent. You can also think of voters voting their pocketbook. Um, did the last four years uh, help or hurt their personal finances? That's going to influence the way they vote. Um, or they might be making prospective votings, voting on promises or hopes for the future. They might be voting uh, and they're making a prediction about which candidate is going to be better for them in the future rather than using retrospective voting. However, most of the time, especially in highly polarized environments like we have right now, the voting is driven primarily by party ID. The most people vote for their the candidate with that, that, that is affiliated with their political party. So to what extent can campaigns and elections influence campaigns influence elector, elections outcomes? Well, there's two goals for the campaigns. They're to persuade voters to support certain candidates and they're to motivate supporters to um, to vote for that candidate. And both of these require money. So there's a kind of proximate goal of all political campaigns to raise money. You want money so that you can spread ads and persuading voters. You want money so that you can pay for get out the vote activities, etc. Um, we kind of already talked about campaign finance bloggers when we talked about interest groups, but just a quick review. Um, in the early 20th century, there was a kind of movement to make more transparency in campaign finance, but there wasn't strict clear limits until the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, which required reporting uh, contributions and expenditures and, and introduced certain, introduced certain uh, contribution limits. Uh, these were struck down in 1976 by the Supreme Court in Buckley versus Vallejo that said the personal, that limits on personal spending by candidates were unconstitutional because money is a form of speech. Uh, in 2002, uh, the McCain Feingold Act sought to uh, restrict the amount of money uh, given to political parties and prohibited coordination with political action committees. But this was later challenged in decisions like McConnell versus FEC and Citizens United versus FEC that eroded the limits and allowed it for unlimited money to independent super PACs that cannot contribute money directly to campaigns but can run issue ads. So. If we're thinking about campaigns and elections, one thing that it's important to think about is what's known as the median voter theorem. And this is the idea that if our political ideology, if, if like the political ideology of the population of the United States as a whole is normally distributed, that is it has this uh, bell-shaped curve, right? Uh, where most people are moderates you know, most people are one standard deviation away from the exact ideological center. Um, and while there are kind of extremes on the tails that these are significantly less than, significantly less than um, the, the center, that most of the, the majority of the party is going to vote for the candidate in the middle. And the extremes of the party are likely to vote for the centrist candidate especially in a system where you have two party rule, two party, two party monopoly. Um, they're going to, if I'm, you know, Bernie Sanders over here, and this is the right, if I'm someone like a strong libertarian, Ron Paul-esque over here, I'm still probably going to vote for whoever the Republican nominee is in 2024, rather than the Democratic nominee who's only farther away from me ideologically. I'm not, like, this is why, you know, most Sanders supporters really did vote for Joe Biden in the end, vote for Hillary Clinton in the end, uh, right? Because they're going to vote for someone who is more in the center. And what this means is that um, because 
in the general election that like most elections are decided by the median voter, this voter, whoever is exactly in the middle, right, that there's a move towards the center in general elections, that, that political campaigns are trying to orient towards voters in the middle of the ideological sphere. Now, of course, that presupposes that we have this, you, that we have this normal distribution. If, however, our political ideology is actually this bimodal distribution, then things get a little trickier because there actually isn't anyone in the center to appeal to. It would actually, you want to try to appeal to your ideological base. And this is actually more, more what happens in political primaries, um, that primaries are not going to be appealed to the median voter, but they're going to be more of a focus on the, on the kind of the base of the party. Um, but really what influences things in political primaries and primary elections are things like name recognition. Uh, if you recognize that person is already in the news cycle, that person is a senator or a well-known governor or is like, has a high profile person, that that name recognition is really going to help in the primary because the oftentimes the information costs are just really high. Visibility, like how visible, how, how is, is, is that person, how often are they on television, doing ads, et cetera? And issue focus, are they able to kind of carve out an issue that is distinctive for themselves? Um, we're in the general election because we're shifting more towards undecided voters rather than to the kind of prime, the, the party, party um, the, more of the, like the uh, staunch, staunch partisans and more active members of the party, you're going to see this shift towards the center uh, and most people are voting straight ticket voting uh, as a party faithful or likely to vote for their party's nominee, whoever, whom, whoever it is. So you're looking for undecided and independent voters. So you have this shift back from the ideological like flanks back towards the center as we move from the primary elections to the general elections. The other goal for the general election is to motivate to turn out. That the goal is not less, especially in general elections, is less likely to persuade, but more likely to motivate turnout. Um, so, do campaigns matter? And the answer is not as much as we'd like to think. We'd like to think, you know, watching the West Wing and whatnot, that like a good piece of political oratory or a victory in a political debate will actually persuade lots of people. Um, but many of the fundamentals, the reasons why people end up voting, are outside the control of political campaigns, people's political identity, whether they are conservative or liberal, their party affiliation, whether or not they are, um, whether or not they are, you know, a Republican or a Democrat, and the state of the economy. Um, you can't change those things. And identity and party ID are, un they become very sedimented and they're unlikely to change uh, through the course of a campaign. And these things prop affect how you process information. So even the campaigns pitched to you, you're going to interpret differently, right? Like if you're a strong Democrat, no matter what the Republican candidate's pitch is, you're going to reinterpret that, the, that, that argument through your own ideological lenses. There's also very few un true undecideds by election time. Even most people who claim to be independents will lean strongly towards one party or the other. There's actually uh, research that has found that like there's very few actual political independents that there's like the, the social value of calling yourself, of identifying as an independent, but most independents actually vote um, straight ticket Democrat or straight ticket Republic. And in 2008, only 7% of independents were actually independents. And the true undecided voters are usually low information voters. That they're not paying attention to political campaigns anyway. There's also um, incumbency advantages that cannot really be shaken by campaigns that the incumbent generally has a uh, ha has has the advantage in the election. Um, president seven out of 10 presidents have had um, one re-election. Senators re-election rates is 71% or higher. Um, and 80, in, in the House since 1982 has an 86% uh, re-election rate. Um, and this for lots of reasons, right? They have name recognition and voting records, right? Like there is a, they can run on a record where their opponent has to run on promises. Um, they have what's known as the franking privilege, the ability to send official mail informing their constituents about things uh, for free. Um, and they, this can't be technically campaign, 
uh, uh, material, but it is a, uh, but it can be a, you know, informing their constituents. So look at all the good things that I've done this session, this session in Congress. Uh, and gerrymandering, the kind of drawing of districts in order to create safe district seats, uh, really can, uh, can basically mean that you have certain districts that are, you know, two thirds, three quarters, one party affiliation that are really not going to change change by it of campaigns. So when do campaigns matter? When there are, in some cases, rare numbers of undecided voters, um, and there are more undecideds late, earlier in the election cycle than in later. Um, and so the campaigns probably matter more in the primaries than in the general election. Um, they also matter when there are uh, resource imbalances where they, um, where they, if one candidate simply has way more resources than another, whether financial or news coverage. Um, and, and campaigns can, are unlikely to persuade voters um, that, that they're unlikely to actually provide information that's going to persuade voters, but they can rally the base. Um, they might not change minds, but they can get the base to become stronger support, to give more money, to vote, to help uh, encourage other people to vote. And, and, and they can move, and they can uh, try to prime and frame the election in ways that, and on, focus on issues that are uh, very value advantageous to the candidate, right? Um, so like Joe Biden tried to frame the election around uh, Trump's character in COVID-19. Trump tried to frame the, the election around the strong economy prior to the pandemic, right? So those different framing mechanisms are really kind of trying to appeal to different advantages. And finally, they can help, you know, voters register and get to the polls, especially when turnout really matters in a close election. And uh, sorry, I've already talked about priming, kind of focusing on these issues that are going to be advantageous. So let's think back to power here. The, um, like voting, if we're thinking about uh, this first phase of power, right, voting really is a blunt instrument. It's less of a means of influencing directly and more of a kind of negative form of power. It's a way of like punishing people who don't do what you want them to do rather than trying to get them to do what you want them. So it's always kind of an after the fact kind of punishment. And campaigns have some effect, but not as much as we'd like to think. But what about this second and third phases of power and with respect to voting campaigns and elections? Well, this, for non-decisional power, well, we can think about uh, du Verger's law, right? That the institutional rules make it really hard for third parties to win elections. And that's going to basically narrow the scope of issues that are kind of focusing on, right? Uh, campaign finance uh, rules are, and, and the way that we have a structured campaign finance that allows for lots of money to be raised in politics creates limits on who can run. If you aren't able to fundraise effectively, if you're not able to raise millions of dollars, you're not going to be, effect, be an effective candidate. And it's not because this money, the winner, this money guarantees the winner. It's not like the most best fundraising guarantees that you'll win, but that you can't even compete if you don't reach a certain threshold. And of course, voter suppression registration limits and voter suppression uh, all are ways of excluding certain voices from the decision making arena. When we're thinking about ideological power, we can think of the median voter theory as a norm, right? We've kind of all internalized this idea that most people are in the center uh, and that we need to appeal to the moderates. We need to appeal to the independent voters, right? That this norm shapes the way that people think about how they are going to run campaigns and what issues they're going to focus on. And because of, you know, the institutional limits to third parties, third parties begin to internalize this failure and you don't really even have serious third party candidates running uh, unless they're self-financed like Ross Perot in 1992. Um, and this is this kind of internalization of defeat that we, well, we might as well settle for the, the dominant party. And campaigns setting the, get to also set the agenda of what's important, right? That they are able to determine um, what issues we talk about, what issues we think are, are, are salient, and that's going to shape the way that we think about what we value and what we want to, you know, our government to do. So the next lecture is going to talk about some proposals for changing the way that we vote. And so like, what if we change the way we vote in this country, what would happen? And should we change the way we vote in this country? So that's it for lecture 7.1. Uh, I will see you for lecture 7.2 in just a moment.